And I'm Don Labonte, the sweet potato breeder here at the LSU Ag Center. And we're going to look at our advanced lines. There's a lot of work that goes into coming up with those very few that we think have potential for the industry. What I really disappointed and can't show you today is we have one of our nine crossing nurseries is way over here in the far corner of our research station. It's absolutely full out to the top of the fences, looks fantastic, and I got the crew here at the station to thank. They do amazing work and they've got a fantastic looking crossing nursery. You can't see it today. A big shame for, a big shame. Across the road though, we also have true seed seedlings. We had about 30,000 true seeds this past year. Each one of those has the potential of becoming a new variety. So we gotta figure out which one's got the stuff and which ones need to be thrown out. And we say very, very few. So we have about three acres of five plant plots of all those different lines that we selected out of the greenhouse that we'll be harvesting probably that middle of November and seeing if we can identify some new potential lines that have that look that might make it to your farm someday. So a lot of work goes into coming up with those few lines that we have that look interesting to us. So let me give you some background on what we have going on today. Um, these are very similar to uh, Dr. Valorden's um, plot. These are 89 day potatoes we harvested on Monday. They were drip tape irrigated, so they've had a good life. One of the issues that we did find is that we had um, about 15 days after planting, we put out some metallochlor, which is dual herbicide. Usually that's well beyond the, the danger zone of using that chemical that to impact the shape and quality of the roots. But you know what? We did get bit a little bit. We did have some damage. As you can see, this is some of that classic symptoms. We have a swollen stem from the plant. We have roots setting at the base of the plant and we have all these side roots so you know what a little disappointing from that but what we were anticip what we really think is going on is that we use greenhouse plants they're very tender very delicate they take a while to catch hold and take off and so putting them out there although we're 15 days past planting we also found but we're also thinking that physiologically they were really not that along in time. They were still just becoming established, so when that metal chlor got put out, we uh, ended up with a little bit of injury. Not, not huge injury, but enough to really impact the shape and quality of most of our, our lines. So that was a little bit of a disappointment that we had, but you know, still overall, we ended up okay. You know, we had some good yields on some of these. So let's go, <coughs> let's go through and highlight some of the things that we're doing today. What we have today, I'm kind of wanting to highlight some of our nematode resistance. And that's something that we're trying to enhance and build. And, you know, we've got guava, we've got southern root knot nematode. We also have reniform nematode. And that's something that we need to make some strides towards resistance. Because that's what really impacts our industry in Louisiana is that reniform nematode. So we have some, the good news is we do have resistance to guava. So a couple of these lines, for instance, 14123 is quite nice and it has some good guava root knot nematode resistance and it also looks like a sweet potato. Sometimes when we, when we work with resistant germplasm, when we have a new disease that we have to deal with, very often the, the germplasm you work with, work with looks horrible. And so it's going to take years and years to get to a point where you actually have an economically viable variety. What's nice about 14123, it does look like a sweet potato. It's got really good yield. It's red skin, so that's not really what we're after for our industry here, where we want that Orleans Beauregard type skin tone. But you know what? It's, it's a good sweet potato, and we had it in our advanced line trials for a number of years, just a little bit less yield than we'd like to see for, that, for, for actually putting it out on the farm. Good news is though, we have it as a breeding line to develop that resistance for guava root knot nematode. Another line that has both guava and root knot, which is really special, is 1431. A little bit earlier sweet potato. Again, it's red skin, but you know what? We looked at it for a number of years as a potential 
um, release, var release variety, um, very, very solid yields, good shape. One of the issues we do see though, it does tend to have a tendency to be a little bit more round, so that's not something that we like to see. But you know what, it's close, and it's really good for as a breeding parent to come up with something that is what the industry is looking for when it comes down to resistance. There's other things that do have resistance to um, to guava, like the Murasaki sweet potato, it's guava, and southern root knot nematode resistant. Um, um, Dr. Villardin showed you a few roots of that. You know, an 89 day potato for Murasaki is pretty darn good because it tends to be a very late maturing sweet potato. Has a high dry matter, so you never get the yields that you might see with a typical um, orange flesh variety. But, you know, if you have some moisture on it, you can get some nice yields. And it does like a sandier soil than our heavy soils here in Louisiana. So let's go ahead and look at some of these other materials that we have today. Um, we have our standards, which I think I'm just about ready to get hit by water, is uh, Orleans and Beauregard. So the back, the back crates are the canners and the front crates are the number ones. And so, you know, we've got some really nice shape on these. Yeah, we do have, we see a few more of these root hairs and that's probably from the metallochlor that we had. And so that's, uh, that, that's a little bit, um, not what we like to see, but you know, overall we had some really nice shape. So, you know, we have this as a comparison. And then let's move on to some of the advanced lines that we're looking at. And really the one that we have a keen, keen eye on is 18100. Now, if you notice, we have two boxes of number one versus one for Orleans and one for Beauregard. Got a box of canners and we got a whole bunch of jumbos. Oh my gosh, is it that much better? No, I think these plants took off a little bit better from the beginning. So that was a, they had a little bit of an edge over everything else, but our data to date is showing that it does have a higher yield out in the field when we go to our production farms. But not this much. This is quite, out, quite outstanding. And what's nice about it, it does have a skin tone that really goes well with a, with a Beauregard. So we're not, you know, there's not a big change up for the industry to have to uh, market something that looks v vastly different um, than what we're used to selling. It also looks earlier. Um, our station just in a, uh, did some early harvest from some of the first materials that we planted um, of 18100, some foundation seed. Guess what? They had a lot of jumbos in it. So it's telling me this has got a little bit of an earliness going for it. So maybe it's that seven days, maybe a little bit more to harvest than what we typically see. We do need an early variety to get our season kicked off and started. Very flavorful variety, good orange flesh, tastes good. And so there's a lot of going for it. And it also has root knot nematode resistance, southern root knot nematode resistance. So that's a very nice feature for that particular line. And when we go back to Orleans and Beauregard, they are very susceptible to that. And so um, it's got a nice plus if that, obviously I don't think that yield is gonna be quite that dramatic when we go to our research plots on the farms, um, but still we're seeing an uptick in quality and number one count. So we're, we're quite keen on seeing that one, how it performs this year as we get further along. Um, some others that we have that also have looked good. 1913 is interesting, although it seems like it really got whacked by the duel. Um, it is an attract. It has been an attractive sweet potato. I can't say it was as, as attractive as I'd like to see it in this particular um, field, but it does seem to have a little bit more skinning resistance. That's something we saw in our field plots last year. Um, so that's a really nice feature. And Dr. Smith has looked at it in some of her. Um, insect trials in Alexandria. We did not find any banded cucumber beetle damage on it last year, which is quite amazing. And also the weevil resistance looked good too. So um, it's got some features to it. They're a little bit unique. The yield's been solid on it. You know, that's where, you know, we look, we, we have some very high thresholds to work with, with Orleans and Beauregard. It's like, where do we go from here? These are really high functioning varieties. So we have to have that edge somehow, some way. So 18100 seems to be going there. 42 is also a really high, high yielding line. Um, it is a lighter skin color, not quite as light as Bellevue, but a little bit more of a, of a um, rose pinkish cast to it than what we see for the Beauregard or Orleans. Um, its shape uniformity is not quite there. I'd like to see it a little bit better, but the tonnage is really exceptional, and we still get a lot of number ones. So um, 42 is um, really uh, 
one that we're looking at, maybe it's more of a processor type. We'll just have to see how it unfolds this coming season. Really like it though. Um, then we got our purples. You know, purples have been a really tough category to work with. We've been working for this with for probably 15, 16 years. And I thought, well, this is going to be easy because what's out there on the market doesn't taste real good. Um, yield's not there, the shape. And you know what? It's been a real struggle to get the yield, the shape, and also a really good tasting purple sweet potato. And we think we're really close now. Um, one of the ones that looks really good and has a good flavor is 1953P. You know, this is a, a real accomplishment to get it to look like a sweet potato <laughs> versus something that, that is all, all twisted um, and no two root being alike. So that's something that we feel is, is really becoming a, an accomplishment. 18115P, we looked at a little bit of this out in California um, last week. And you know what? It looked really attractive hills. Um, again, it's got some really nice root shape on it. And that's a big deal for the purples and also a good sized root. You don't always see that with a purple. And the 161P, again, it's kind of one of those, which one's better, you know, as far as yield, productivity, flavor is good on all three. The 161P has also been a, a solid performer as far as yield and shape. The 115P looked a little bit better in this plot, but you know what? You need to look at these things in a lot of different plots in order to figure out what they actually have the potential to do. And that's one of the challenges. We got to look at these seven, eight, nine different plots in a given year to really determine, get that sense of what they can do and not do. And that helps us get further along in order to be confident to get that out to the industry. 115P, uh, nematode resistance, you don't have it on your sign? Um, some of those we do not have some of the data. So I'm thinking the 115P did not have southern root knot nematode. Are you going to break any of those purples open for us? They're, some of them are lighter skin. You know, the thing is, you have to let them, you have to let them mature <laughs> to get that deep purple. You know, they're, that's a trick with the purples. You get them really deep, dark, they taste really bitter, and they cannot be as flavorful. Even though that looks a little bit light, when you bake that, actually, it's going to be quite purple. That bleeds quite well once you bake a sweet potato like that. So it's a... Um, it's, it's one of those things that we find that if you leave them in the field longer, you're going to enhance that level of anthocyanin. So we kind of don't go for that super deep purple because I don't think you get the flavor that you're looking for. But we do have, but it's got to be a, at a high enough level to really get that purple crowd happy. So we always have to, it's always a challenge uh, what you try to achieve. All right, this is one of nine crossing nurseries we have. This is up at our sweet potato research station. Of course, we're having our field day today and couldn't bring all everyone out to see it because it's just too wet. But you know what? I'm disappointed because this is one of the best nurseries we've had up at our station in a long time. Usually by mid-August, we're still looking at climbing up the entire fence for our, our vines, but you know what? We're there already. Um, got some great flowering, although you know what? We're probably not going to get any seed set for some time. It's really neat. It takes a, a cool night, short days, and then we start to get seed set. So we're really looking more mid-September, first part of October, before we really start to see some seed set. This is an open pollinated nursery, so we're letting the bees do the work. Um, bees don't like wet weather, so they're not out today, but basically we're going to be um, allowing them to, to, to cross, go from plant to plant, the bees tend to go down the row rather than across, so we strategically place different lines next to each other that we'd like to see cross. And so it's really a, a, a very traditional approach to breeding. And what we do have in here are real thoroughbred uh, varieties and lines. These are the ones that really give us some good progeny so we can come up with that bigger, better, new variety in the future. And so, for instance, right here is uh, one of our, um, our, our Bellevue varieties, always nice heavily flowering. Um, sweet potatoes are not always easy flowering, but we do, we have selected over time to get that flowering to occur. And so it's a lot of work to get these um, vines up onto the fence. That stress helps them, it creates a nice environment to get um, seed production. They can't be luxuriously grown, um, just doesn't work, they won't set seed, so it's a, a nice compromise between 
getting the vine coverage as well as not getting them over fertilized. And so it's a little bit of an art to get there. So we generate a lot of seed out of this crossing nursery as well as our others. Others have more specific purposes. For instance, we have one for nematode resistance, one for insect resistance. We've got a purple flesh. We got all different kinds of nurseries that are trying to generate progeny for different needs. And so that's something that um, we're seeing more and more is there's lots of variability. We just don't need an orange sweet potato. We need lots of different kinds. And so by having different nurseries, we're able to meet that goal. We just looked at our crossing nursery and we generate maybe about 30,000 true seeds a year. So we produce a lot. Um, sometimes we can't put them all out in the greenhouse, but each one of those has a potential to become a new variety. So from that population of greenhouse plants, we'll put them out in the field, we'll allow them to get a growth flush where we can cut five plants from each one of those lines. So that's a lot of cuttings. And what we end up doing is having a five plant plot. So here's a good representative of that, where we got five plants of the same line, have no clue if it's worth anything or not. And we have, we have uh, probably well over a hectare, um, two, three acres of sweet potatoes like this. And what we're gonna do is come back in the fall, harvest these, and even though we start out with tens of thousands, we're probably gonna be able to reduce that down to maybe about 300. So selection is really tough. We, it really has to have everything that we're looking for with shape, yield, quality in order to make it, to save it for that next year of evaluation. So it's the start of a process, it takes maybe seven, eight years before we actually release something. Because after we have, the, we have something that looks good from a yield and shape perspective, we also have to screen it for diseases. So it's got to have those major resistances to the diseases our industry faces. Um, it has to perform well in good and bad environments because we have to have a crop no matter what. So there's a lot of evaluation that goes on all throughout the United States and elsewhere in order to identify those few rare lines that actually make it up to that status of becoming a variety.